one image breeds another. I think in a film... Under Milk Wood is possibly the most famous work of Dylan Thomas, one of the foremost poets of the 20th century in the English language. Quite a big deal. For the uninitiated, very much like myself, it's a non-narrative film originating from what was called a play for voices, which is entirely focused on the fictional southern Welsh fishing village of Llanagib and the characters within it. The work is, as far as I can see, characterised by some rather striking sexual imagery and lots of alliteratious... Uh, alliterate... Alliterate... Alliterative wordplay. Some disclaimers from the start. We're not here to analyse the play or the films themselves or to give any synopsis for newcomers. I'm sure that's been done to death already by people far more educated, qualified and enthusiastic than myself. Also, I've got to say, I've never been a particularly big fan of particularly radio plays and not even poetry. I guess I've never had the training or the artistic now to critique it, you could say. So just to let you know before you take my word as read, you know what I mean? But however, as a blogger on movies and of course Welsh movies, Dylan Thomas is a name and a character who crops up often in the history therein. What is that grammatical structure when it says the history thereof, the people therein? I really like it and I need to use it more. So there have been quite a few films where the character of Dylan Thomas pops up as a biographical or fictional character, the standout of which perhaps is 2015, I believe, Set Fire to the Stars, starring Elijah Wood and Hollyhead's finest, Kellen Jones, as the man himself. Set Fire to the Stars was set in New York among the final days of Dylan's life when he was trying to put the finishing touches to Under Milk Wood. Now, just as Dylan more or less failed before his death to complete a finished version of Under Milk Wood, so the filmmakers of the world you could say perhaps have failed to really nail down a cherished or much loved definitive adaptation of his play for voices. There have been many adaptations in various forms over the years, even I believe an animated version by the Welsh language TV channel S4C back in 1993. But what we're going to do today for International Dylan Thomas Day on the 14th of May is analyse the three movie versions of Under Milk Wood. We're looking at the 1971 film directed by Andrew Sinclair, the 2014 movie or movies, there were dual versions in the Welsh and English language directed and written by Kevin Allen. And interestingly, there was a BBC TV movie in 2015 directed by Pip Broughton. So we're stretching things a wee bit, you could say, by analysing the BBC TV version, but it does feature a lot of bona fide, bona fide, whatever the hell that word is, movie stars. So I thought, why the hell not? But anyway, let's start with 1971's Under Milkwood, directed by Andrew Sinclair. Now, this dude apparently got himself in the director's chair by virtue of a very close friendship with Peter O'Toole, who plays Captain Cat. O'Toole's then wife, Shan Phillips, the Welsh actress, plays Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard. And incidentally, today on the 14th of May is not only International Dylan Thomas Day, but it's also Sean Phillips' birthday, and today the Welsh actress is 86 years old, so you've got to say, Dion, Pembloid Hapis, Cariad. So this one stars Richard Burton as first voice, most notably, and much cherished Welsh comedian Ryan Davis playing second voice, also with Elizabeth Taylor as Rosie Probert and Glynis Johns, daughter of Mervyn Johns, as Mufanwy Price. An interesting bit of casting from a British point of view is also David Jason as No Good Boyo. Now, if you're from the United States, you've probably never heard of David Jason, and in my opinion, you're not missing a hell of a lot there. Right, so I watched this for the first time last month, despite owning it for a couple of years previously, and what was my reaction? You know, it's all right, it's, it's watchable. It's definitely got its charm. Honestly though, it's now real special looking at it from a modern perspective. 
The standout thing about this movie is the international cast. The coup of getting O'Toole and Liz Taylor is pretty damn big. These days I guess the equivalent would be to see some people like Michael Fassbender as Captain Cat with Angelina Jolie as Rosie Probert. Okay, not exactly an ideal casting from an artistic point of view. But imagine what a shot in the arm getting actors like that in a Welsh film would be for S4C or Film Cymru Wales or anybody who is making intellectual Welsh property. But more on that later. For now, let's look at some of the historic reviews and sound bites of the film and I'll tell you how harsh or how bang on they seem to me. Back in 1971, The Times writes this. It's hard to know what to say about a film of Undermilk Wood, except that there is really only one way it could turn out, and that is precisely the way this one does. The enterprise is, after all, doomed from the outset by the doomed from the outset by the nature of the original material. The essence of Dylan Thomas's classic play was necessarily its use of words, of word painting, to evoke with intense vividness all that in the nature of things we could not see. The Guardian, also back in 1971, write this. What St. Clair has done is to transpose the piece virtually line by line into visuals. So if Thomas talks about the sea, we see it. If he mentions love, then we watch it on screen. Perhaps the cinema is simply the wrong medium. Even so, there is another way other than mere duplication. What the camera could have done was to sing its own song of praise, almost as a commentator or second poet. A freer adaptation might have risked raising more eyebrows, but it certainly would have shut fewer eyes. On that note of shutting eyes, I've got to say at times I did struggle with this version. A runtime of 97 minutes is perhaps a bit too long for a non-narrative film, and it does have a very tranquil, sleepy quality, which while perhaps being quite appropriate for some of the tones of the original work, can leave a modern viewer, such as myself, feeling a little bit weary at times. The film it reminded me of most of was the Peter Greenaway film Drowning by Numbers. There's just something about the insular, idiosyncratic uh, behaviour of the local characters which really reminded me of that piece. I don't know exactly how many different versions of Undermill Wood Richard Burton contributed to in his life. For example, I've got this uh, CD radio play here, which is a cracking listen whenever you're driving in the car. But in this one, although it may be sacrilege to some, his face just kind of seems a little bit out of place and a bit distracting, if you will. His voice, though, of course, as ever, is enough to make even the most alpha of males consider crow black bobbin seas and cucumbers. <clears throat> I think that fella from The Guardian is a bit harsh here. I'd agree that the camera work and mise-en-scene... God, I hate saying that. I'd agree that the camera work and stuff that's in the frame is a little bit bland and could definitely have been more imaginative, but it's not quite as literally visual as the guy makes out. I'd also take slight issue with the Times assertion that Under Milk Wood is necessarily unfilmable. I get the principle that it's essentially about words, and I'm a big advocate of film story being done visually whenever possible, but let's look at how some of the later, more modern films tackle this very real and common problem. So, Under Milkwood and Dan Iwenath from 2014. Have I pronounced that correctly? I didn't even do my research on that. I'm a disgrace to the Welsh language. This was produced as part of a series of events to mark Dylan's 100th birthday, or what would have been Dylan's 100th birthday in late 2014. Clocking in at 87 minutes, I watched it for the first time in 2016, pretty drunk on Jack Daniels and intensely stoned on skunk weed. At that time, I very much enjoyed its separate parts, but I never really relaxed into it. I then decided to make this video, so I put it on DVD again in March this year, this time totally sober, and I don't smoke skunk weed anymore, and what did you know, I totally enjoyed my experience. So much so that I went straight to my bookshelf and read the play for the first time in order to give myself some context for watching the 1971 and TV versions and also for doing this video. Have a look at some of the critics' reviews of it in a minute. For me personally, my favourite things about this film are, well, it gave me the horn big time. I make no apologies for saying it, but the Welsh women in this film, from Charlotte Church up into Sharon Morgan, are just absolutely delightful. But it's not just the visual aesthetics, the whole treatment is so naughty. 
with a feeling of unrequited longing and eroticism making its way into nearly every scene. Along with the visual layer of this colourful, gooey, sticky decadence, a little perhaps inappropriately in places, as one review we'll look at later has pointed out. It's a very sexy piece of work, and I do believe that Kevin Allen was not entirely satisfied with the 1971 version's less than raunchy treatment of the text. Although I wouldn't put disagree with that, I think the 71 version has definitely got its raunch. By the way, Kevin Allen, he's on my Facebook friend list. You know, we're mates. I call it sacrilege, but I find Reese Evans' narration as first voice considerably more subtle than Burton's. Evans' work here very much gives the impression of the necromancer, which complements the dreamy, decadent quality of most of the visuals. I think it was perhaps a mistake to have Evans playing Captain Cat as well as doing the narration. The whole point being, after all, that the narrator is supposed to be, first voice is supposed to be watching over everyone in the village, including Captain Cat. Rosie Probus is this time played by Christian Emmanuel. Now, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, Christian, but you know, I did tweet you to check and you didn't respond, so I hold no guilt there. This movie is definitely bolder and riskier than its 1971 predecessor. The images are consistently rich and alluring, and the town of Solver works wonders for the tone and helps give the film its otherworldly quality. But also, I'll come out and say it, the rich visuals couldn't help but make me wonder about a more narrative-focused version of Under Milkwood, which sacrificed some of Dylan's beloved words. And that leads us onto some reactions from professional critics in 2015. Dylan Thomas is of course a popular figure in the United States. So let's look at the magazine and website Variety, who had some interesting things to say about the film. Here we go. The disorientating visual style is doubtless entirely intentional and aims to complement the woozy witching hour quality of Thomas' purplish prose. But it's too manic a technique to sustain a feature length film without compromising the goodwill. I disagree there. I think the visual style and the work by the DOP Andy Hollis complements Dylan Thomas and Kevin Allen's writing and Reese Ifan's narration very, very well. It's not a movie whose visual elements can be simply disregarded. However, Variety do go on to make these two points, which I believe are very relevant and worthy from a Welsh perspective. Thomas fans with an appetite for endless scenes of hearty romping featuring song-prone villagers will have little cause for complaint, but commercial potential will be otherwise restricted beyond the film's home turf. Its UK release in October, meanwhile, was confined to a single screen. The film wraps a reunion for Swansea-based Alan and his twin town star, Rhys Ifans, an element of likewise limited appeal outside Wales. The submission of a simultaneously and identically shot Welsh translation, as Blighty's bid for the foreign language film Oscar belies the pick's minor status as a local curiosity. Partly funded by S4C, both English and Welsh language takes on the film were shot back to back, allowing the latter to represent the UK in the foreign language Oscar race. Still, it's the English lingo version that best represents the original work of Thomas, who, after all, wrote exclusively in English. With or without an Oscar nomination, the pick's international prospects are limited. This Under Milkwood is ultimately a niche offering. I find this very hard to disagree with. Variety also say this. For this edition, Kevin Allen must contend with a more low-key cast, which need not have been a bad thing. Of course, if you know my YouTube and online profiles, you'll know that I'm a big advocate of Welsh performers getting Welsh roles wherever possible. But I'm also a very big fan of Wales marketing itself overseas, particularly North America and the United States, and I believe this is a case where compromise could have been a wise move. Under Milk Wood is one of those rare pieces of work that not only has international fan base and appeal, but is also very, very Welsh, perhaps even defined by its Welshness. In other words, this is a golden opportunity to make some money and sell Wales overseas, particularly in the United States. And boy, didn't we bring the hype with that one commercial cinema screen in the UK. This is a risky, bold, and visually glorious adaptation, which should have been seen by millions of people across the world. Of course, it wasn't. 
Right, now here's the bit where I need my tin hat. Again, if you know my online profile, you'll know that I'm a huge supporter of the Welsh language in nearly any context. Both my children are bilingual and go to Welsh school and I will promote, celebrate and defend the Welsh language until my dying day. And this also, as an English monoglot, includes some standpoints that can often be unwelcome or controversial in the Welsh language community. And here's one for you. I don't really see the need to make a dual English and Welsh language version of this film. And I'll explain why. This is one of those cases where I believe the inclusion of Welsh could be a bit of a turn-off for some of the potential audience and could give some ammunition and credence to the anti-Welsh brigade, particularly within artistic and creative communities. Although Dylan is potentially, or clearly you might say, influenced by the rhythms and sounds and the beats of the Welsh language, he was a poet, as Variety pointed out, who writes exclusively in the English language. The whole point of his work is to celebrate his love for the words, the English language words. Back onto the film itself, the British paper, The Independent, wrote this. Even if the source material resists easy adaptation, the film has some strong elements. At times, Alan struggles to combine the skittish slapstick with the darker elements in the story. Where the film risks coming unstuck is in his crude comic riffs on ideas contained in the writing. For example, Thomas makes it clear that Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard is extremely bossy. Alan then takes it as license to portray her as a dominatrix. The film has a dozens of surrealistic tableau-like scenes with the narration just about holding them together. At least, even when the more wayward visual gambits don't quite work, Alan pays scrupulous attention to the writing. It may not be the recommendation he was looking for, but for this is a film you can watch with your eyes closed and still enjoy. Although I kind of agree with that last part, like I said earlier, this is a film with serious quality in its visual aesthetic that cannot be disregarded, but yes, I do agree, it's also very, very pleasant on the ear. After finally reading the play, and incidentally, it seems to me a work that is absolutely meant to be read out loud, maybe on your own, definitely with a couple of whiskies, I just cannot see the reason to portray Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard as a dirty dominatrix. The film has enough sexual imagery and suggestion going for it. And this kind of seems like hammering it home, just a little bit too hard. Now in 1972, she was played by, as mentioned, the birthday girl, Shan Phillips. And this can segue us nicely onto an analysis of the 2015 TV movie produced by the BBC and directed by Pip Broughton. What's notable about this is that many of the actors who feature in Kevin Allen's film also appear here as different characters, which can be a little bit confusing if you watch them both on the same day, like I did last month. Most notably Charlotte Church, who despite reading Mrs. Ogmore Pritchard with gusto, is very, very miscast in this role. She's supposed to be a widow of two, and as perhaps the youngest cast member, I think they just got that wrong. Also, we've got Nia Roberts coming back, this time as Rosie Probert, Stefan Rodri as Mr. Waldo, and he was Mog Edwards in Kevin Allen's version, and Sharon Morgan, Mary Ann Sailors in both versions. Birthday girl Sharon Phillips is back, but this time as Mrs. Pugh. It's got an absolutely belting cast of Welsh film stars, musicians, and celebs. The voices are spread around this time between Sheen, of course, Matthew Rhys as New York voice, and Amy Fionn Edwards as Llan voice. We also see Tom Jones, Yuan Rion, Catherine Jenkins, John Rhys Davis, and Eve Miles, just to name a few, plus all these other familiar Welsh faces. What this one does completely differently, and at times successfully, is almost make it an overt reading of the text. It's made clear, looking direct at the camera, that some of the contributors are reading from the book itself sometimes even into a laptop. Now, I'm not sure what the point was of the laptop. Perhaps it's meant to give the piece some kind of meta reflexivity, or maybe it's an attempt to comment on the connectivity of the international appeal of the movie, being as it was shot in various locations around the world, including New York and um, Bangor. While very, very watchable, inventive and original and clocking in at a satisfying 57 minutes, 
me, I'm all about short films. Um, this one at times feels like something cobbled together in the edit suite, perhaps, and I mean perhaps, without a coherent, consistent vision from the beginning. And that may be a little bit harsh, I'm not sure. But what does definitely confuse is we get these constant cutaways or these cutbacks to the village of Hlanagib, which is a little bit at odds with the rest of the stuff and seems a little bit distracting because all these famous voices and faces that we see in the film just don't seem connected to Hladagib in any way at all. The most interesting review I found online came in Wales Arts Review and the Welsh critic Gary Raymond. So Gary writes this. That this production of Under Milk Wood seemed tidily ramshackle was no mistake. It is in the true spirit of Thomas's work and this was the crux of the success of the production. There's something in the way the camera moves, the way the lines are delivered, that the casting, no matter how cynical one might have been at first, really made this about at least an aspect of Welshness. Executive producer has managed to put in place an energetic, fun-filled and highly respectful version of the radio play. One that has bypassed the problem of its lack of visual allure with a mixture of fast-paced editing and an understanding that Under Milk Wood is a work of sewn-together cameos. What better way to honour it than to pepper the screen with proud and recognisable faces that give them some poetry to speak, like it's the Dylan Thomas advert for the Welsh Tourist Board. You know what, Gary? You've almost convinced me. I go along with every single word of that, mate. Although I do think the film could have definitely benefited with more Michael Sheen. He's just lovely, isn't he? There we have it, Wales in the movies. Which one is my favourite? Well, I'm not exactly convinced yet, although Gary Raymond has done a very good job of nudging me towards the 2015 BBC version. I think that it's a toss-up between that and Kevin Allen's English language version under Milk Wood in 2014. But it's really up for grabs. The poll I did recently about this on Twitter almost broke the internet. But what was notable was that the 1971 version directed by Andrew Sinclair came out a clear winner and in second place was Kevin Allen's version. But not under Milkwood, the English language version, it was Dan Ewenelt, the Welsh language version. A little bit of cultural nationalism, I think, going on there, you naughty Welsh Nats, you. The truth is, I'm a little bit thick. If there's anything blatantly obvious I've missed pertaining to an analysis of the film adaptations of Under Milkwood, please let me know in the comments section and also feel free to chip in with your thoughts, your favourite version, whether that be subjective or objectively. Before then, if your Welsh poetic appetite has been whetted, listen. 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 It is night, it is night moving, moving in the streets. Street. The processional salt slow musical wind in Coronation Street and Cockle Row. It is the grass growing on Llaregib Hill. Dew fall. Star fall. The sleep of birds in Milkwood. Look. It is night. Dumbly, royally winding through the Coronation cherry trees going through the graveyard of Bethesda with winds gloved and folded and dew doffed tumbling by the sailor's arms. My answer and care. Time, Time passes. Time passes. Listen. Listen. Time, Time passes. passes. Come closer now. Come closer now. Come closer now. In a slow, deep, salt and silent black bandaged night. Only you can see in the blinded bedrooms the comms and petticoats over the chairs, the jugs and basins, the glasses of teeth, thou shalt, thou shalt not on the wall, and a yellowing dicky bird watching pictures, pictures of the dead. Only you can hear and see behind the eyes of the sleepers the movements and countries, and mazes, and colours, and dismays, and rainbows, and tunes, and wishes, and flight, and fall, and despairs, and big seas of their dreams. From where you are, you can hear their dreams. 
as, as in a poem, one, one image breeds another. I think in a film, it's, it's really the visual image that, that breeds the other one, and it uh, breeds and, and, and breathes it.